welcome everyone. My name is Max Saltonstall, and I'm here with four awesome authors from Tor. Can you each just introduce yourselves briefly and tell me a little bit about what your book is like? Um, I am Elizabeth Baer. This uh, 2015 is significant for me because it is my 10th year as a published novelist. Congratulations. Um, and I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> still here. Still clinging on. My newest book is called Karen Memory. It is a Wild West steampunk adventure novel starring heroic saloon girls versus disaster capitalists. And I've been describing it as sort of like leverage if the good guys were hookers. <laughs> pretty accurate. Yeah. So I'm Jim Cambius. Um, my new book, it's my second novel, it's called Corsair, and it is a near future hard SF take on a classic science fiction trope of space piracy. Uh, basically I figured out that you can make space pirates work if you leave the pirates on the ground. Um, and it's, uh, so it's a uh, comic thriller about uh, Captain Black the space pirate and his nemesis, Captain Santiago of the Air Force. I'm Brian Stavely. I write epic fantasy. The first book, The Emperor's Blades, follows three adult children of a murdered emperor. There's a, a monk, a special forces soldier who rides on these sort of giant birds, and a politician. And they're trying to figure out who killed uh, their father and not get killed themselves. The second <coughs> book that's here is The Providence of Fire. Hi, I'm Max Gladstone. I write post-industrial fantasy novels, <laughs> sort of Gandalf meets Grisham. Um, we have, uh, you know, dead gods with shareholders committees and wizards with pinstripe suits and bankruptcy transactions reinterpreted as sort of necromancy performed on enormous semi-sentient spiritual entities, that sort of thing. <laughs> Basically the workaday world. Um, and my new book, Last First Snow, is about human sacrifice and zoning laws. Awesome. <laughs> Full stop. Basically. <laughs> so, so you've each... You each approach very different parts of fantasy and sci-fi, and you've got, I think, really interesting different settings. How did you go about researching, say, your, your Pacific Northwest sort of gold rush or yes. your, your space pirates? How did you get into that culture of it? Well, in, in, for, the, for the Pacific Northwest, I, um, I cheated a little bit because I made up a city. Which, from Rapid which I City. took Rapid City, from which I took all of the elements that I really liked from the history of Portland, San Francisco, and Seattle, and just stuck them in a blender, you know, into the Vitamix, hit whiz. So it's got with San giant Francisco robots. with giant yeah. robots. It's got uh, San Francisco's Chinatown and Seattle's history of the buried uh, waterfront city, and you know, so basically like the good bits, the good parts version of the Pacific Northwest during the Gold Rush. And then I read a whole bunch about the Gold Rush, and I visited all of those places, and I... Alaska? Uh, no, I have, there's, there's no, I will, I will probably have to go to Alaska at some point, but not for this book. Um, I read a lot, of, a lot of Jack London, though, does that count? Sure, that's fine. <laughs> Any relationship to Rapid City, South Dakota? Um, other than the name, no. Um, so, for Corsair, I'm... It's, I'm keeping it in the relatively near future. It only takes place in something like 2030. So I tried to, it's as contemporary feeling as I could get away with and still have space pirates. Industrial operations on the moon and valuable payloads of helium-3 being shipped to Earth. So I kind of assume that, say, tomorrow somebody decides, yes, that's what we'll, uh, that's what we'll do and, and begin setting up the infrastructure for it. Um, I think NASA actually just gave you the announcement you wanted yesterday. Yeah, well, there we go. And I've been completely cut off on this book tour. Of, <laughs> I don't know. Are we at war with Norway? You know? we're, we're on an asteroid <laughs> hurling through the Northeast. Yeah, currently. That's how rumors get started, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> and, We've uh, always been at war with Norway, Jim. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, it's, as cl it's mostly the contemporary world with, with people stealing spaceships. We well, took some, some liberties in terms of how are things going to progress? Well, yes, I have, you know, I, since it's 15 years in the future, I had to throw in self-driving cars, and um, right uh, there's a, uh, there's a pirate-themed resort island, which doesn't really exist, but could easily exist. And should. And, um, but most of the rest I tried to keep as familiar to the reader as possible, because that's not what the story is about. <clears throat> so, so how about those self-driving cars, Max? <laughs> <laughs> When your tour takes you to Mountain View, I'm sure we'll conduct an interview inside one of them. I used to teach um, 
ancient world history and philosophy and comparative religion. So that was all valuable material for the world building. But um, you know, there's also a lot of personal experience that goes into the books. For instance, the, the special forces guys, the Ketrol, uh, they, they do a lot of training. And I, I do this sport called adventure racing um, that, I've, that I've drawn on in my conception of the Ketrol. And one of the things I would do with my adventure racing teammates, we had a thing where once a week, you could call another person on the team at 2 AM and assign them a two-hour physical task that they had to get up and do then. So you could call someone, and, and one night I got the call, get up, you up? Yeah, I'm up. Find a 45-pound rock. OK, I have one in mind. Go carry it for two hours. <laughs> and so the Ketrol have to do a lot of things like that, and I've drawn on some of those experiences. This in, is a uh, sport you do for fun? Well, that's just the training for the sport. <laughs> but it gives you a sense of what you end up doing in the race itself. We're using a loose definition of fun here, or an endorphin-dependent <laughs> definition of fun. Indeed, anyway. exactly. Well, there's, I don't know if you're familiar with this term. There's uh, type 2 fun. Does this sound, does this sound familiar? <laughs> type type 1 fun is like fun when you're doing it, like drinking good wine or having sex or whatever. Type 2 fun is miserable when you're doing it, but you look back on it fondly. Like um, writing. I think we call it <laughs> like, like writing. <laughs> writing is type 2 fun. Hazy. And type 3 fun is just Horrifying and never fun. <laughs> so not, not actually fun at all. Type 3 fun is only fun when your grandkids are talking That's about right. the time. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Type, yeah. type 3 fun is fun when you're getting drinks off of it 20 years later. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Shackleton's expedition was Type 3 fun. <laughs> oh. Oh. Wow. They all survived. Um, they all lived and went off to fight World War I when they got home. Well, that worked Goody. out. <laughs> type 3 fun. Type 3 fun. World War One. All right. Um, so... The research for my books comes off of talking to a lot of my friends and being an enormous nerd, so the metaphors that I would use, I'd reach out for for trying to describe what like a bankruptcy lawyer I was talking to or a guy who was working in, um, in like nonprofit sort of organizing and fundraising, trying to figure out good metaphors for what they did, I write, reached for magic, basically. So my wife's mother is a bankruptcy attorney and I grew up in basically the middle of nowhere in Tennessee, and as far as I was concerned, bankruptcy was what happened when the company ran out of money, you sold all of the stuff, and then you used that to pay back people. And I was talking with her, and she said, well, no, you, you know, the company's worth something as a going concern, so you try to figure out how to make it keep going, and there's, there are protections that you put in place. And I thought, well, okay, so you have, you know, you put a magic circle around something, and you have this dead body in the middle, and you carve it open, and you start taking out stuff that's rotting or doesn't work quite well. You argue with all the other people who are doing this at exactly the same time. And then when you think you have a working body-ish thing, you stitch it all back together and get the lightning generator hooked up, and like Delta Airlines rises off of the slab and shambles <laughs> forward, <laughs> talking about, I don't know, increasing shareholder value or making flights arrive on time or something. And you just summarized three parts dead. Yeah, that's three parts yeah. dead. So that's my first yeah. book. and, and um, I kept poking into other aspects of this world. So assume that like necromancy is a metaphor for a certain kind of law. What would other things look like? And by the time we get to Last First Snow, we have a desert city that bears moderate resemblance to Los Angeles um, that used to work just fine because they had a bunch of relatively oppressive gods that they worshipped who provided water and utilities and things like that. But then there was a revolution. And all of those gods died, and then you're left in a desert city with no water, and so you need to figure out what you're going to do about that, and there's some understandable civil unrest. So as the revolutionaries, these sort of immortal wizard king type people, are trying to figure out how to become water utility magnates and fix up the city the way they want it to go, um, they run into people who liked the city the way it was before. And Having, having with lived human in, sacrifice. Yes, yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> having, having lived in uh, Las Vegas for many years, um, the Las Vegas Valley Water Authority is the closest thing to a god yeah. that that city has. <laughs> well, that's, and that's what I mean. Like, more and more of the modern world makes sense to me, sort of exclusively yeah. filtered through this fantasy lens. So, Don't I, tell a lot of people that. Yeah. <laughs> more and more of the modern world, I can only see it through the lens of fantasy. Well, yeah. I mean, certainly don't tell the people who are going to come after me with the white coats that <laughs> we're possibly they watching watch on YouTube. You <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, there's a lot of stuff that um, seems, seems like magic to mm -hmm. us on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Self-driving cars. Yeah, well, self-driving cars or, you know, the smartphone, which there are very few people who could describe how to go from raw material to finished smartphone, especially if you build in an app ecosystem and the network communications technology that is required for the thing to be even remotely useful. 
right? People can't really go from farm to table on one of those. <laughs> so I think they're born, not built. Yeah, so they're that's just, it. There's little eggs. Now, that I'm, hatch now I'm picturing somewhere. farm to table smartphones. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're Neil crunchy. Stevenson. Yeah, Neil Stevenson well, wrote a book about that. <laughs> and that's why we had the whole phenomenon of legal thrillers. I mean, you referenced yeah. John Grisham because increasingly it feels like dark magic that <coughs> no one understands, really. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, Cory Doctorow is all about the farm-to-table smartphones. Ah, uh, yeah, right. That's, that's pretty much his shtick, yeah. actually. So what did you take out of your most recent book? Like, what did you, what did you end up pulling oh, okay. to, make it, to make it stronger? Oh, what, 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 did, what did we cut? Uh, yeah, what, did oh. you, what, what ended up on the, on the editing room floor? Just about 60,000 words. <laughs> I'm I'm actually I'm that weird subspecies of writer who underwrites. I mean, my, are you allowed to? Yeah, my my early drafts are like fifteen to twenty percent shorter than my finished drafts because they're very Spartan. Mm -hmm. They they tend to be missing a lot of things like transitions and character motivations and and important th things that are, it turns out are important to the reader. So I have to go back and put all that stuff in. So I'm, I guess I'm I'm the opposite of Stephen King. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to admit, I'm kind of in the same boat. I tend to write short, so when I handed in the original manuscript for Corsair, my editor told me, this is not long enough to publish as a novel. <laughs> Please make it bigger. It's magical how you get from the manuscript to the novel process. Yeah. Eggs, right? Uh, eggs. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Writer eggs. But um, I was able to, you know, that, that actually, I think it makes it a not just because it's longer, but I think it, it, it enabled me to add several more characters and, and I think make the story a bit more interwoven. And so uh, I'm very, I'm glad that they told me to do that. Sort of a building in layers approach. Yeah. Right, right. And yeah, I start off very much like, like Jim, I start off very scaffoldy, mm -hmm. you know, and then it like, it's, it's super pixelated. Like my early drafts are super pixelated and then I have to go in and focus down and focus down and focus down and then eventually you have a nice sharp, clear mm -hmm. story. But zoom and enhance. Zoom and enhance, <laughs> zoom and enhance. Yeah, it's like CSI, only it actually works. Ah. <laughs> See, I go for the like make the block of marble first and then chisel the block of marble away <laughs> thing. So I write very quickly, almost sort of on automatic, and then I'm in, I end up with a 160,000 word manuscript that becomes a 105,000 word manuscript over the process of paring it away. So I you repeat could actually tell us what you cut. Yeah, well, but the funny thing is once I'm done cutting, I almost never am aware of what I cut. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is repeated description or, you know, you have a conversation that's three pages long that becomes a conversation that's one page long because you have one major beat that needs to be hit. Um, there are <laughs> chapters where I had, you know, two characters who were going through a very long sort of rambling set of stories about their lives that then just simmered down on the stovetop to become... Uh, maybe a, a page and a half long. So there are some very short chapters in the book because that was the one beat that needed to be there. Um, and then I added in some sort of other side plots when they became absolutely necessary. I realized the book was missing stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously a big part of the job for any of us is building the world. And sometimes it's not immediately evident in the moment how much of the world you need to build. So in, in the third book that I just finished, for instance, there's a, a very tall staircase and to me, it was sort of implausibly tall. And I, and I spent a long time trying to figure through the engineering in this staircase, and what kind of wood are they using, and how's it all put together. And my wife read it, and she's like, what is all this crap about the staircase? It's like four pages of staircase building. <laughs> Just nobody cares about that. <laughs> and I thought, oh, it, yeah, that's. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, nobody does care about that. But for me, I, I often need to write that stuff, and then maybe two, two lines make it into the final text. But in my head, at least, I know how that staircase was built. If somebody that's, comes at me the next book tour, I've got answers. That's the iceberg effect. <laughs> mm -hmm, absolutely. Like 10% 10, 10 of your world building is above water. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's, you get the, you have the iceberg approach or the gilding approach, right? Yes, or the electroplating approach. The electroplating so Tim, approach. Tim Powers' term for, for you electroplate on the research, and as long as it's flawless, it can be one molecule thick and nobody will ever know. Questions? Can I follow up on a particular point? Yeah. Um, since you spoke last, I'll address it to you, and also because I read Karen Memory, and I enjoyed it very much. Is it is that a world you had written before, or is that a is that did that grow full blown? That is a that is a brand new world, um, and the the, the book uh, was about. I think I wrote the first sentence in two thousand and nine. Um, 
and it took a long time to sell. It was actually very fast to write, but mm -hmm. it took a long time to sell because it's it's weird. It's not any of the like really accepted subgenres. Um, it's a little bit steampunk, but it's also a little bit weird west, and you know the the non traditional protagonist and all of this other stuff. Um, the um, the world itself was just the result of a lot of reading and, and cogitating and wandering around in Seattle underground and, and uh, parts of San Francisco and just trying to... And um, there's a lot of actual historic inspiration for the characters in the book. There's, there's a character in there, uh, Mary Lee, who's a, a young Chinese-American woman who uh, rescues... Her, her shtick is that she rescues young women who are... Uh, being sexually trafficked, and there were people like her in San Francisco in the 1800s. Um, so you know, there's a lot of just sort of these these little bits of American history that have been erased or forgotten or aren't part of the narrative, but are so cool that I wanted to talk about. You've already answered the question I was going to follow up with, which is, um, I mean, I love when I open a book, particularly a standalone book, and there's a full world. You know, I can imagine the amount of work that goes into that that you know never shows. And I was wondering if all of you could talk a little bit about where your worlds come from. Well, um, Corsair, like I said, is mostly contemporary reality. But my first novel, Darkling Sea, um, you know, that was a, that takes place on an alien planet with its own native inhabitants and involves both the the local inhabitants, the human explorers, and a, a second spacefaring civilization which is in conflict with the humans. So I had to I had to build two uh, alien ra alien civilizations, alien species for that, um, and that was a, a, a lot of fun. Um, but as to the the background, you know, to some extent, it's you know because we were been interested in all this our whole lives. It's why we're in this job. So, you know. The preparation for writing Darkling Sea was well. I minored in astronomy in college, and I married a biologist, and I, you know, you cheated. You know, Pre yeah, preparing for that moment all your life. Yes, right. right. You know. Stealing ideas this from one spouse my... over the breakfast table, time honored tradition. This is the reason that the second book tends to be like really hard because you write the first book, and that's your whole life up until that moment, and then you sit down with another blank sheet of paper. I also find there's there's top down uh, sort of world building and bottom up world building. So the top down stuff is you start with a big idea about theology or whatever. But there was a moment, you know, I'm, I'm thinking more about my third book because I just got done with it, where I had some characters in a room, and you know I didn't want them just sitting in an empty room, so I need to to fill that room in, and, and I put in some statuary, and then the statuary needs to be of something, and I thought, oh well, this character will have statuary of these gods. Um, and then I need to think of how the gods are depicted in that statuary. And all of a sudden, you're coming at the theology not from, this is my pantheon, and then here is how it works on the people of this world, but from, I need some crap in the corner of this room, and suddenly <laughs> the pantheon is growing out of that. Um, yeah. and, so though, and, and hopefully those meet in the middle. For, I talked a little bit about where my world's coming from earlier, but um, there's one particular night that I can think of. I'd, I'd just gone to see Psycho, and Slavoj Zizek was introducing it. It was like this weird thing that was going on at the Brattle Cinema in Harvard Square, if any of you guys have ever been there. Um, and I was walking back, and everything just looked profoundly weird. You know, cars were coming by, and I thought, Jesus, that's something that's, you know, two, three tons that's just rolling down the street at, uh, you know, faster than a horse could run. And I think this is totally normal. Like um, the, the equivalent of like monkey me, you know, 10, 20,000 years ago would think this was a transcendently weird experience. And that moment when you realize that you are living past several singularities. Right. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's, the, it's the naked lunch moment, right? Yeah. You see what's exactly on the end of your fork. And thinking about how I could write a world that was, that, that seemed that weird to us, but would also seem close enough to something that we, to the world that we live on a day to day basis, to highlight the weirdness of the world that we live on a day to day basis. I mean, that, that's kind of the seed that a lot of the stuff was coming out of. I need to get across town, let me just grab one of those giant dragonflies and give it a little bit of my soul. And then yeah, be, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Have my meeting on time. Yeah. Question? Okay, so you talked a little bit a minute ago about bottom up mm -hmm. world building. I'm not sure who on the group goes top down. I think I'm sorry, Mr. Gladstone, if I yeah. remember that. Yeah. You know, you were giving this big description from Three Parts Dead, which mm -hmm. I haven't 
read you have this really interesting, fascinating world. Now, assuming you start there, if you do, I don't mm -hmm. know if this is how you work or not, how do you go from here's this wonderful, weird world and then find the characters and the plot to put in it? Well, at least the way that I was interpreting what you were saying is that it all feeds into itself one way or the other, whichever direction you're going. So if you have this strong umbrella image of what the world, how the world fits together, then the next question you ask are what kind of people come out of this world? And then what do they want? And then where do they want to go? What does their day-to-day -day life look like? Or if you're starting with the day-to-day -day life stuff, then you can blossom up from that into what are the major concerns that they're dealing with. Or, or both simultaneously. Yeah. It's, it's the, at least the way I do it, it's very synergistic. I've had books that started with a sentence, with a character, with a thematic statement, with an argument I wanted to have. Um, and all of them present their own, uh, their own struggles. But the thing is that it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Like you get one piece, and then you fill in a bit around it, and then you find a corner that looks like it matches. And you put it where you think it goes, and then you discover, no, actually, it's over here. <laughs> and, you know, it... it, it it happens on different levels and from different directions simultaneously. It's not a linear process. I imagine there may be people for whom it's a linear process, but I am not them. I like to follow a test which is um, what stories can be told in this setting that cannot be told in mm, yeah. the, the world in which we are sitting right now. So you know, if you're postulating a future with um, you know, interstellar travel, what stories can you tell that you can tell that you can't tell in a story in a setting without interstellar travel? And you know, since most stories involve uh, somebody wanting something or being afraid of something or being convinced of something, what what fears or desires or convictions are possible in that world, or are impossible in that world that would be possible in our own? Because that's the flip side. You know, you can have Winston Smith wanting to be able to sit in his room and not be watched, you know, in 1984, which is a, a desire that he cannot satisfy. <clears throat> There's also a, a, a just brute force technical writing element to it, I find. Sometimes if I'm starting a chapter with um, plot, let's say I have a plot point that I want to get through, and it's not working, I'll double back and I'll say, let's just let the characters go. Let me, let me tackle it from a character point of view. And if the characters don't have anything interesting to say, maybe I'll start with a long description and see if that generates anything. And so uh, for me, and I don't know if you, you all find this, those different approaches are ways to, to get into and past some of the roadblocks I run into. And, and even more than that, if I'm having a hard time writing in a particular way, I will change my process up. Um, mm -hmm. Like if sitting at the computer typing isn't working, I will take my laptop and go somewhere else, or I will take a notebook and go somewhere else, or I will, I have uh, actually like written on little scraps of torn up paper because it feels insignificant. You're just scribbling, right? You're brainstorming. So like the, the sensor part of your brain doesn't get involved. Um, and I also will sometimes like go back and reverse outline what I've already written to see where it's going. That is so much smarter than what I do. <laughs> Would you sit there and bang your head on the keyboard? Yeah, well, no, just bang my head against the story until you can see this something. Dent, right? Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this, is that, this is that ten years of experience. It, it, it's iron head training, is <laughs> what I'm getting myself in for. The different, the different physical mode is actually something I've used as well. I'm, I'm parent, and any of you who have kids know that they need to be driven places a lot. Um, and when you're waiting for something to finish, take along a notebook, and you can just sit and sort of write out, not necessarily story prose, but you know, think on paper, so to speak, about you know, what is this person doing in this story, and why do, what, what should he be doing, and things like that. My wife calls this the crazy papers stage. There comes a point near the end of each book where there's all these plot threads, I'm trying to yoke them together, and that's when she comes home someday, and I have computer paper and post-its all over the wall, and she just thinks, oh, so we're serial do, killer moment. We're, we're, yeah, we're doing the crazy papers again, huh? It's, yeah. it's just going to be a week or two. It's just going to be a index, week or two. Index cards with the spray tacky stuff on the back. Yeah. And you just stick them in one. And then, you know, have them on the table, and, and she's like, can I just move these for dinner? No, no, you cannot move those for dinner. That's why you stick them on the wall. <laughs> that, stick them on the wall. That, that's gold right there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, generally the time when I when I sit down to actually do the outlining is when I've gotten so far into the draft mm -hmm. that absolutely everything looks horrible. All of the choices mm -hmm. are bad choices, and I just mm -hmm. want to set it on fire. And that's when the reverse outlining, like, how what do I need to do to just end this book? Right, comes and into play. it's also really useful to like go through and write down everything that's unfinished on an index card, and then you spread them out on the table, and you 
pick one up and say, okay, this is a doable thing. <laughs> and you do that thing. And then you put that index card in yeah. a different pile. Getting and things done for novelists. Yes. Yeah. This probably works for, proud. this is probably like good for anybody because, you know. Uh, we the, call it sprint planning. But yeah. It's yeah. the same thing. The, the, the thing that I'm, I have been attempting to teach myself for the last three years is that the little fuzzy animal, the, that little mammal that lives in my head doesn't like to be punished. And if I punish it for doing the things that I want it to do, then it will stop doing those things. So what I need to do is when it behaves, I need to give it a cookie. And you know, if I'm like, if I'm mi having a miserable time and it's not working and things aren't going well, I need to like get up, take a break, wait for that moment when the when the animal gets bored and gives me an idea, and then I give it a cookie. And you know, it's it's self training. You're you're habituating yourself to do the thing that you want your brain to do. It, and this explains why you're. Find yourself having a beer at like eleven thirty in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> or carrying a rocket at two in the morning, <laughs> yeah, so, or that. No, so that's why, why there's a little that's dispenser punishing. with rat chow pellets yeah. next to your laptop or cocaine. <laughs> before before I went full time, um, I asked John Crowley, um, what, "What what should I be aware of? Like, what what are the risks?" And he said, "Well, there's going to come a point. You want to be very clear with your wife about how this all works because there will come a point." when she will come back from work, from a very hard day at work, and she will find you sitting on the couch in your underwear, watching soaps and eating jelly beans, and she will ask you, what the hell are you doing? And you will say, I'm working. And you won't be lying. And she just needs to be ready not to murder you then. I find it impossible to picture John Crowley sitting on the couch eating jelly beans in his underwear. I, I this, this was the advice that the man gave to me. Um, it's, well, yeah. The, the, it's not the, happened yet so far. The third novel divorce is, is an axiom in the genre. <laughs> you know, it's, it's <laughs> actually industry term of art, the third novel divorce. This is, that's, that's the point when your spouse realizes that this is never going to stop happening. <laughs> it's a cycle. It's a cycle. Yeah, exactly. My wife is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> do, you have, do you have a character that you've written that you would like to actually spend time with? Yes. Yeah. 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 Which, would be, which would be your favorite? The Assassin. Oh, oh God, yeah. <laughs> Provided I wasn't on the list. <laughs> Why? Uh, she's got a good sense of humor and she likes life. I, I try to have at least one character in, in every book who I wouldn't mind being stuck in an elevator with, mm -hmm. because that's what writing a book is like. It's like being stuck in an elevator with this person for nine months. So I, I'd love to spend time with Connie, because it looks like she cooks a real mean breakfast. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, she'd be um And especially when you're writing like a first-person narrator, you need that person to have that kind of, because then if you're, if you're writing a first person narrator or a single point of view character who is not somebody who your reader wants to be stuck in an elevator with, they're gonna go spend their beer money on somebody else's book. And that is not the outcome I want. So, so trying to write characters who are charming and interesting and you wanna hang around with, even if they're maybe not nice people, like you wouldn't necessarily give them your checkbook, but you might take them out to lunch and listen to them rant about politics. Is there one that stands out for you? Um, Karen's actually great for that. She's, I mean, she's a fun character to write because she's one of those characters who runs toward the sound of gunfire, mm -hmm. which is a great quality in a protagonist because then you don't have to do any plot work. You know, somebody screams, she runs toward it, and the plot handles itself. Um, another one I think I would really love to hang around with is actually the, the protagonist of my first book, um, Jenny Casey uh, in Hammered, who was a ranter. And she was one of those people who, one of my friends who was uh, beta reading the book for me commented that, that she really liked reading it because Jenny was the sort of person who she could imagine going out for with a pizza and, you know, like putting a quarter on the table and saying, okay, five minutes, Toronto City politics, go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would just happen. <laughs> like. For me, it would be um, the, the hero of my first novel, um, Broadtail, who is a a giant lobster who lives at the bottom of a lightless ocean on an alien world and is awesome. you know, a gentleman and a scientist. But does he drink beer? Um, undoubtedly, it would be lethal. Um, <laughs> they have stinger, the stingers, right? Yes, he would, get, there... he would get stung. Yeah. You know, neurotoxin. That's the neurotoxin there, of yes. choice, yeah. <laughs> well, you could have a beer, and then he could yes. have neurotoxic stingers. Um, I, 
So Elaine Kavarian, who's the sort of mediator slash necromancer Team person. Elaine. Team Elaine. <laughs> Team she's Elaine. amazing. Um, it, I'd want to meet her once and then be very far away. Yeah, no, I mean, she's the kind of person that I would love to have an informational interview with, you know? <laughs> um, as long as she's not seeking you out for an interview? Yes, exactly. Yeah. That, would, that would be problematic. Um, the King in Red, who is this sort of enormous uh, li skeletal lich lord guy who's in charge of basically water and power for the city of Drizetti Alex, where the fourth book takes place. He's, he's a lot of fun to hang around with, so long as you don't get on his bad side and he like turns you inside out or decides to string a liar with your nervous system or something. Pay your water bill. Yeah, exactly. Pay your water bill on time. And don't let any demons come out of the tap. Yeah, yeah don't let any demons come out of the tap. I think the King would be an interesting uh, lunchtime companion. Yeah. Any other questions? From <coughs> so when you write characters who are decidedly unlike yourself, um, how do you keep the characters true to who you want them to be, and where do you draw inspiration for those characters? We were talking about this a little bit last night, and I, I was saying that this is where I think the the technical effort of writing coincides with the moral effort of living, mm. in that uh, you know when I was in high school, I would go to these parties and be like, she's an asshole and I don't want to talk to him. And that was bad living, right? But it's also crippling for a writer because you don't get those characters into your head. And you know, as, as I got older and, and even more and more, this is an ongoing process, mm -hmm. I find people, all kinds of people, more and more interesting. And that leads to a better life, which is really nice, but it also makes it a hell of a lot, a lot easier to write the characters in, in books. Yes, the, the characters may be externally different from yourself, but in order to be able to write them at all, really, you have to find that zone in your head somewhere which can be mapped onto them. Well, but sometimes uh, writing somebody who's very culturally different from myself for whatever reason, um, what I try to do is go out and read a lot of fiction by people who fit into that demographic because reading books about, you know, uh, 19th century China is very different from reading a bunch of books, even in translation, which is all I can manage because I'm an American and I speak one language fluently and two very badly, um, is, you know, read, the, read, read primary texts or as close to the primary texts as you can get and, and in that way kind of try to internalize the cultural values. Um, and this is just as, as relevant in, you know, 21st century America uh, 21st, America is a big country. There are a lot of people in it with a lot of different backgrounds and a lot of different social and cultural expectations. And I have to, you know, I'm a I'm a 43 year old uh, white female Yankee, um, and those are all things I need to be aware of when I am writing somebody who is not those things. Even if it's even if it's a generational difference, that their expectations are going to be very different. So. Two, uh, two sort of approaches that I use. One is very close to what you guys are talking about. Um, the more, I don't know, the more intense your self-image, the more you're like, I am this kind of person, I do these things, I do not do these things, the harder it is to write characters who are unlike yourself. So the more you can break open that and find parts of you that may be in internal contradiction or conversation, that's where some of the really cool characters are going to come out of. And then, of course, like epical research in order to be able to capture um, people who are not like you. Um, the other thing, this is sort of a dumb trick, but um, there are situations in which commonalities of human experience come out a lot more. Um, as someone who really likes writing thriller plots where there's a lot of like, what's going on? Oh my god, we're being attacked by giant whatever is like, let's run, the bomb's about to go off. Whenever you get people down onto like the most basic hierarchy of needs levels, it's easier to write authentically folks who are very different from you and very different from one another. Mm -hmm. And if you can get your characters on that level, then sometimes if you have done enough research and if you've done enough of the spiritual work that Brian's talking about. <laughs> I don't know if it's spiritual, but. Yeah, it's spiritual. It spiritual yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for whatever definition of spirit you want to be working on, right? Um, then you can progress from that up towards the sort of higher levels and figure out how the character would differ from you or anyone else in more state or less um, immediately life-threatening situations. But, but also the thing that, that James is talking about plays into that that, 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 that looking at the parts of yourself that are not the things that are part of your, your yeah. immediate identity. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I am this kind of a person. Well, yes, I may think I'm this kind of a person, but there are 
you know, there's a lot of conflicting stuff going on in my head, and there are urges and rationalities and logics that do not, that, that the little guy who thinks he's driving the machine um, is not necessarily cognizant of like and would can, not want to acknowledge. Like if you can make that sort of Whitman step, right? Yeah. yeah. If you can be large and contain multitudes, <laughs> then it gets easier. Yeah. Contradiction. And study anthropology. I mean, that's, that's the other thing. Because the, uh, the entire purpose of an undergraduate anthropology degree is to alienate you from your own culture and the rest of humanity so that everybody looks like an alien, including yourself. <laughs> also, <laughs> the lobster people. And the, oh, the, no, the lobster people are like. Also, read old books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Read books written in different times as well, because that way, you know, the, the world of the 19th century or the 18th yeah. century is not our world. Mm -hmm. Have you read? What have you read that's really changed how you thought about fiction or about writing? What have I read that changed how I thought about fiction? I, I mean, I suspect the answer for all of us is tons of stuff, yeah. right? If you ever get to a point where even for you know a year or six months you have the same idea about fiction or writing, that's probably kind of a bad sign, right? And so y you, you stumble from crisis to crisis where you read, you know, I just read David Mitchell for the first time, for instance, and it, I thought, oh no, there's all these other things I haven't even been thinking about. Um, <laughs> no. But that's just the latest example of that, and hopefully if you're reading good stuff, every writer provokes a kind of mild crisis where you think, I wasn't doing that. Um, How and can I? Yeah. And, and, and I think the moment where you start thinking, yeah, I'm on top of this, mm -hmm. that's probably... That's do, probably a bad, a very bad know. point to be. That's, my my agent claims that there are no words that strike more terror into her heart, heart than an author saying, "I really like this book. I think this is." No. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because people think that it's the ideas that one gets jealous of, or yeah. that one like wants to hoard. Mm -hmm. But it, like ideas are a dime a dozen. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. Mechanics. How did you manage to make me cry there? Mm -hmm. How did that happen? I am going to make one recommendation, though, and it's an odd one. It's a short story collection by Robert Roger Zelazny. Mm. Um, I, yes. was, you know, I was going to Frost and Zelazny. Fire, I think it's called. And he has wonderful story introductions and afterwards to each piece in that. And taken together, they are an excellent guide to how to be a fantasy and science fiction writer. Zelazny, um, let's all talk about Roger Zelazny. Let's. <laughs> there are worse the, things. Y'all should be reading Roger Zelazny. Y'all should be reading Roger already. Zelazny. The. Um, there's this thing. I remember, I remember precisely like the two things that made me understand how unreliable narrators worked. And one of them, one of them was the Rick Springfield song Jesse's Girl. Right? <laughs> Where like the 357th time this thing comes on the radio, you're like, oh. <laughs> because the song knows why this guy can't get laid, even though he's a first person narrator and he doesn't know. You know, the, the, the song is presenting a portrait of this absolutely represent, reprehensible human being who is totally not self-aware. And the other one was, um, uh, I was halfway through, it was like the third or fourth time I had read the um, Roger Zelazny's Amber novels. I was like halfway through The Guns of Avalon and I remember I was standing there in the shower, right, both hands in my hair, getting the prell in there, and I went, that son of a bitch is lying to me. It just like... It clicked, that the, you know, and in my defense, I was probably like 14 years old, but I mean, it just clicked that the narrator was actually lying to me, and that was why things in the story didn't match up, like, like his version of events didn't match up with what other characters in the story were saying, and it was, you know, epiphany, you know, the mind blown gif, mm -hmm. it was like that, except with more shampoo. <laughs> Yeah, Zelazny was one of the early ones for me, too. His book, Lord of Light, actually. Yeah. Like, getting it... This is a novel of layers and layers and layers and layers and An layers. An epiphany in every book. Right. You have... Um, so, spoiler alert. Um, there's been a colony ship that's crashed on a distant world, and several hundred, possibly a thousand years later, um, the descendants of the colonists have set up this civilization that's based off of the culture that they were coming out of, which is sort of Indian subcontinental. And... Um, the crew members had figured out body-to-body -body transmission and cloning and have set themselves up as gods, many of them from the Hindu pantheon. And the book is written almost in-universe. So it, the language is that of a uh, kind of prose translation of the Mahabharata. But the experience, like what's actually going on underneath, is pretty well thought through science fiction. And the characters who are 
operating in the milieu are like aware of both aspects. So there's one guy, who, uh, Sam, the main character, wants to start a revolution against these people who've set themselves up as gods. So he thinks, well, I'm going to, I'm going to invent, invent Buddhism in this context <laughs> and go about being the Buddha. And so it, on the one hand is this narrative of the construction of Buddhism, and on the other hand, like a sort of scientific, uh, science fictional sort of political ploy and the open question of, is this a fantasy novel? Is this guy really the Buddha? What does being really the Buddha entail in this sort of a scenario? Is, is this science fiction? Like, every single layer gets activated. And the more I read it, the more uh, sort of parts it of the onion I keeps, feel back. The, 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 yeah. the Matryoshka doll after Matryoshka doll it just keeps unpacking. Yeah, and the, the, the notion that you could do so many things in one book, which is smaller than I think most novels that get published today. It, they, would, they would send it back to Jim and tell him to write another 20 Yeah, books. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then what I find happens is you, you, you get obsessed with something like that, right? Mm -hmm. you've, read, you've read this book and you think, I need to do that. Mm -hmm. And you spend a year doing that. Mm -hmm. And then next year, there's the next thing that comes along. Well, you're like, I, now I want to do that. And the thing is that you're really bad at this thing that you really desperately want to do, and you screw it up, and you screw it up, and you screw it up, and you finally go, oh, I'm never going to figure this out. You go on to screw up the next thing and discover that you're doing the thing you couldn't do when you were actually trying to do it. Am I the only person that's No, happened? no, no. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, what did y'all do before you became full-time writers, and what was that transition like? High school teacher and terrifying. <laughs> I had a, I had a, a, a series of, of stereotypically crappy artist jobs. I was an office manager. I was a stable hand. Um, I did microbiology procedure manuals at Hartford Hospital, which was actually a great job. I love my boss. Um, I wrote uh, news summaries for a clipping service, uh, I, a job I refer to to this day as the media mines. <laughs> I think the Spice Mines of Kessel, except watching Dateline. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, actually, the reason I went full time was because I was living in Las Vegas at that point in time, and uh, the tourist economy crashed after 9 11, and I lost my job. So there was nothing else to do. You know, it was like I got pushed. It was, it was a baby bird scenario. I did not like make a conscious decision to, I'm going to go right full time now. It was like the job with the safety net went away. I kind of took it sideways. I, um, in many ways, um, I was uh, I had a couple of jobs in publishing, but then I moved with my wife to a place where there were no publishing jobs, and so I decided, well, this will be a good opportunity for me to try freelance writing. Um, but I was doing it in for role playing games. I was writing uh, source books for various role playing game publishers and. Back then, every game publisher had a house magazine with adventures and supplemental material in it, and you know, I could write a 3,000-word role-playing game magazine article a week. Um, so you know, the main problem was finding enough outlets for my output, um, and uh, also doing some, some freelance nonfiction writing. Um, and it was only uh, after I had begun to sell some short stories that I decided to, to make the transition to writing fiction. Uh, I was teaching in China for a couple of years and writing books on the side and came back in 2008 just as the um, US economy did the Anakin Skywalker face plant into the lava. <laughs> it's amazing how often that like a, the economy yeah. doing a face plant into the lava figures in these stories somewhere. Which, which was sort of the prompt for writing Three Parts Dead because you know mm -hmm. bankruptcy and lawyers sort of flying off to try to save the country was you know a lived experience of a lot of people that I knew at that time. And um, in 2009, I had a job working for a sort of white paper sort of marketing firm in the Boston area, and that was going on for a few years as I was trying to sell the books, writing more books, and then one of them sold just as my wife was getting a good job, and it was like, grab the brass ring while it's coming around, see what happens, and I've been hanging on to the brass ring ever <laughs> since. There's another question. Yeah, but... um, in that regard, since you brought it up, uh, like, I mean, in this day and age, how do you go about, you know, you have your, you have your first completed novel, at least the, like the first one you're like mm -hmm. happy about. How do you go about, you know, selling it? Do you publish it online these days? Do you go, you know, do you go the E.L. James route? Or do you print shop it around? We're and all... even then, what do you do after you print, like you said, like you printed your first one and then you have more. And then how do you keep going if you don't have, like, especially if they're not within the, within the genre confines of, of like sci-fi or something else? To answer the second question first, um, as soon as you finish 
a book, at least in my experience, the next book is kind of waiting there to, to get going. And the process of selling a novel is a long and complicated one with many paths and byways and tangles and turns. Yeah. So the only thing to keep me sane anyway was to start on the next book. Yeah. And finish, finish the submission draft of whatever book it is. And if you're going the agented, you know, traditional publishing route, you start trying to find an agent with a series of queries and, and query letters and submissions. And meanwhile, you're writing the next book. Um, when, when I broke in, I had written three novels that had been rejected by various agents before the, uh, before the fourth novel that I had written was picked up by an agent. Um, and by the time she sold it, I was actually halfway through the third book in the trilogy, which worked out really well for me because I got a three-book deal for my initial contract rather than a two-book deal, which contributes to buzz because anytime anything a little out of the ordinary happens, the publishing industry goes, oh, you know, this person got a special deal. They must be... And really, it was just that I could, like, deliver two manuscripts yeah. immediately. Shh. <laughs> 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 oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of facing that hurdle right now is, yeah. you know... Uh, I I wrote Corsair mostly before Darkling Sea came out, but I'm still finishing the next book, even though Corsair is already on the shelves. <clears throat> so I'm struggling to catch up, basically. How'd you get published? Why, why is everyone looking at me? <laughs> yeah, it's broken. Yeah. <laughs> right. This time uh, I, 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 I thought I was... I came at it from totally left field, and I didn't know anything, and I was stupid. And so I thought, well, Game of Thrones is like 300,000 words, so I'll write something that's about 300,000 words. Um, my editor is sitting here just holding, <laughs> twiddling his head in his hands. Uh, that seems like a good way to start, and it was not. Don't, don't do that, by the way. No, no agent will look at some random person they've never heard of and think, oh, 300,000 words, that's a great length for a book. They'll look um, at it and laugh. They'll yeah. get a good belly Yeah, yeah that's right, it. and then never respond to you. Yeah. Um, a nice length for a trilogy. Well, it, yeah. Um, so, but eventually I found an agent, and um, and then the agent, you know, does the negotiation with various publishers. Okay. So. That's, yeah, I mean, I've done some self-publishing, but it was all after trad publishing for me. Okay. One more question back there. Um, how did you go from an idea to, like, committing to that idea, meaning, like, I'm going to create an entire novel around this idea, and, like, how many ideas do you cycle through before you committed to or how do you fail faster? Yeah. Well, that's actually, yes, a damn good question. Um, uh, for the first one, it was, you know, that was the, the, the idea I had at the time, which seemed like I could make a novel out of. Um, but the next one, actually, for Corsair, I followed sort of an interesting approach, which um, I had heard about from uh, Mary Robinette Cole, which is she kind of draws up a list of novels she'd like to write, and then asks her agent which one they could sell. <laughs> and that's sort of what we did with Corsair. Uh, you know, it's, this is a book that I could write, and my agent thought it would be, the, of the ones I had su suggested, was the one that was most sellable. Yeah, once, once you're established, you get <coughs> a fair amount of input from editors and agents as to what they might like to see next. Um, when, when I'm just starting out, or when I'm writing something that's just for me, like, you know, like short fiction that I'm going to then write and sell as a completed piece to a magazine, which involves a you know, submission and rejection process. Um, still, to this day, I still get rejections. The way that works is basically when I have an idea, I start a file for the story. Um, if it has a title, I give it a title. You know, I save it in a file with a date. And every time I work on a story, I save it in a new file with a new date, because that's how my backup system works. That way, I have iterating. You know, if one file gets corrupted, I have everything on either side of it. Um, the and then basically, I just wait until unless I've got a deadline pushing me, I wait until the idea becomes compelling, and then I write it. And the thing is that that ideas never go away. I've got one short story, which rejoices in the title of uh, "On Safari in Relay in Carcosa with Gun and Camera." that has consisted of that title and a first sentence since 1989. Awesome. <laughs> and, and now I've got now I've got like a paragraph and a half 
and this sucker is going down before 2020. That's my commitment. <laughs> and I know it's going to be like a 5,000 word short story, but it's just taken me forever to get my teeth into it. I've had a similar one. It, uh, I'm not going to spill the title, but mm -hmm. I've got a short story which I keep coming back to every year, and it's like, can I write this one yet? Uh, no, as it turns out. I also think books, <laughs> writing a book is a little bit like mountaineering or marriage, right? You, you know, if you have a peak in mind, um, you don't know what the weather is going to do. Yeah. All you can do, you check the forecast, you check the conditions, you're as sure as you can be that you can do that that day, and then you get to a point where you just go for it. it, it you know, same way with marriage. You can't be certain what's going to happen in 20 years, but you know you love that person, and you're as sure as you can be, and then you go for it. And I think it's, I, I feel the same way with writing a book. Okay, I think I can do this, I, and, I, and I love it. And a book is a shorter Here we go. commitment than marriage. <laughs> yes, yes. Most books are a And less deadly than mountaineering. Yes, I was saying hopefully a longer commitment than a yeah. mountain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and less deadly. So, less gnomic, but honestly, I have a... a <laughs> I am a gnomic here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's good. Um, I have a notepad on my phone, like one little note document, and if I come up with an idea for a book, I'll write it down. And I generally have a couple of projects on deck. Um, and this was true before I ever got a publishing deal. I had you know, the book that I was working on at the moment that I kept chipping away on. You really need to finish something if you're going to ever have a hope of getting it out there or even just showing it to your friends. And be like, hey, check it out. Look, I did it. Read it. It's great. And then you watch them while they're reading it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little creepy, what do you think? Max. Eh, well, you know, I never claim not to be creepy. Fair but enough. anyway, so... Um, <laughs> so so yeah, so that's like a nine-month process for me. And it's slower for some people and faster for others. And that means a lot of ideas just pile up, and they just go in the notepad. And I almost never look at the notepad. The question is, which of those ideas that I actually committed to virtual paper anyway mm -hmm. stay alive in the mind until I'm sitting down and I'm staring at the end on the like, second or third book that I had plans to write? And I was like, wow, what am I? Oh, that one. That one. They, they just live. Thank you all very much for coming. We've got some books in the back, and you can stick around maybe for a couple minutes to do a little bit of yeah. signing and chatting. Sure. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thanks for having Thank us, you. everybody. Thanks, everybody.